Welcome everyone to our webinar on conserving bees in your backyard, how to create habitat for New Mexico pollinators in small spaces. Caitlin Haas is going to be giving the webinar today. Caitlin is our Southwest Pollinator Conservation Specialist at the Xerces Society for Invertebrate Conservation. She's based in Santa Fe. She just received her master's degree in environmental science and policy from Northern Arizona University, where she studied aquatic invertebrates. Uh, before grad school, she studied a variety of different um, types of wildlife across the in different systems across the US. And as our po Southwest Pollinator Conservation Specialist at Xerces, one of Caitlin's goals is to build climate resilient connected pollinator habitat in Santa Fe and across the state. So I know I'm looking forward to learning more about how we can all contribute to this in our yards and gardens and small patios and other small spaces. So this webinar is going to run for about an hour, including some time for questions at the end. Um, you'll notice we have an additional presenter here. Stephanie is providing us with live captioning for this webinar. So if you'd like to turn on captions, you can head down to the bottom of your screen and click on the three dots that say more, and then you can click show subtitles. This is also where you would hide captions if you don't want to see them. Um, throughout the webinar, please feel free to submit questions and comments in the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. The earlier you submit a question, the more likely it will be answered. Uh, I'm going to be in there answering questions as we go along, um, and then we'll save some for Caitlin at the end. Next Tuesday at the same time, I'm going to give a webinar on attracting and supporting pollinators on farms. Um, so I'm going to talk about what we've learned about how pollinators contribute to different crops and crop yields and how habitat can be integrated into large gardens and farms and ranches. So that webinar is sort of more intended for farm audiences, but if you wanna learn more about crop pollination, please do join us for that. So with that, um, let's get started. Great, thank you for that introduction, Emily. And thank you to everyone who's tuning in today. Really excited to talk about this topic and how to help you create habitat for uh, pollinators in your small spaces, like your backyards, your gardens, your, even on your balconies and porches. So first I'll be discussing the importance of how these small spaces in urban and suburban areas can connect pollinator habitat. What are the essential features of good pollinator habitat and how you can make your space more sustainable and attractive to bees, butterflies, and more. And like Emily said, when I'm going through the slides and you have any question about anything, feel free to type in uh, your question into the Q&A box at the bottom of the screen. So with that, I'll get started. And I wanted to quickly note um, what the Xerces Society does. In case you aren't familiar with us, you didn't see the first webinar in the series. We're an international nonprofit organization dedicated to the protection of invertebrates and their habitat. And invertebrates are animals without a backbone. So things like insects and snails, and they're an extremely large and diverse group of wildlife that are critical to the function of our planet. So the Xerces Society main office is located in Portland, Oregon. And we have regional offices throughout the US and we just recently added New Mexico to that list and we're really excited to be here now. And uh, you can learn more about us uh, if you check out our website at Xerces.org. And in the very first webinar of this series, I, I talk a little bit more about what we do. So let's talk about habitat. Conserving pollinators really starts with habitat and almost all types of habitat can make positive contributions to the abundance of pollinators. Undeveloped areas and open spaces are extremely important to maintaining really robust populations and a diversity of pollinators. But pollinator habitat can occur at all scales from an entire national forest to a small herb garden on your porch. So developed areas like city parks, roadsides, and anyone's backyard can provide habitat for pollinators based on three key elements. Those three elements are food in the form of usually flowers for nectar and pollen, but then also the plants themselves, um, 
for larval like caterpillars to eat that kind of food. Um, and then shelter, nesting, and overwintering sites. They need somewhere that will be safe from any disturbance so that they can make it into the next year. And then finally, safety, so a place free of pesticides. And in order to support pollinators, we need to um, think of these three key main elements when we're uh, thinking about creating habitat and um, making sure that we hit on all these three key elements. So the reason why habitat is so important is because habitat loss and fragmentation is the leading cause of extinctions in insects and pollinators. And while we have more rare species that are threatened with extinctions, our common species are also experiencing really major declines and that restricts what they do for the environment. So the amount of pollination that is getting done is not as great um, when we had more habitat for pollinators. And the amount of habitat directly influences our insect diversity and abundance. So if we have very little habitat, we won't have um, nearly as many species and not as many individual pollinators. And so things like um, a yard that is just rock and not plants, that's, that's not a lot of habitat. But in urban areas, because fortunately, uh, insects are able to use really small patches and partial habitats um, to complete their life cycle. So urban areas can so provide um, good habitat for many pollinators. And an example of this is our western bumblebee here. They occur from all the way up from Alaska down here to the southwest. Um, a study in, that occurred on Vancouver Island found that these bees um, were supported by late flowering resources at urban sites, so flowers that bloomed later in the year. And that urban sites on Vancouver Island could support a high abundance and richness of plants and pollinators, so lots of different species of plants and pollinators. So our vast intact natural areas are really important and they're important core sites for wildlife and they can support many sensitive and specialist species. And these natural areas do experience degradation and can benefit from restoration and more pollinator friendly management. But for the most part, these places provide what pollinator communities need to thrive. And in our more developed places like towns and cities, you may not think of those areas being great at supporting wildlife and being great for conserving pollinator habitat. But because uh, these insects can use these small patches of habitat, we can transform green spaces in urban areas that can support pollinator populations and also reverse some of that habitat loss that we've caused um, by developing in urban areas. So when we're talking about habitat and how to improve it, we can think of it in a few different ways. So it can either be created, so from a place where it was completely removed, we can uh, tear up our rock lawn and turn it into a more garden that will actually be habitat. It can also be improved by enhancing plant diversity um, and abundance. So it might be okay habitat, but if you include more plants, maybe it can support more pollinators. And it can also be connected so that pollinators can move from one area um, to another much more easily. So there, this little figure shows some like examples of pollinator corridors, like roadsides can be really good corridors and that helps connect those different pollinator populations and gives them a way to move around to resources that they might need. So in urban areas, connectivity can be a challenge because the majority of space is often paved or developed 
Um, but if we combine efforts between homeowners and renters, municipal and commercial spaces to landscape in more pollinator friendly ways, that can really add up to a really great amount of habitat and allows for that movement and connectivity in urban spaces. So for example, uh, in Albuquerque, there's a program put on by the Friends of Valle de Oro Refuge uh, called the Albuquerque Backyard Refuge Program. And what they do is support Albuquerque residents in turning their outdoor spaces into habitats for birds and pollinators and other backyard wildlife. And so they're a really great uh, program to get in contact with if you're in Albuquerque. And in Santa Fe, well, um, this is in the works right now, but the ZC Society is working to launch a pollinator trail through the city to help improve habitat and habitat connectivity for pollinators. So let's talk about the first element of habit, pollinator habitat, and that's forage. So the food that pollinators need, that includes um, nectar, from flowers, pollen from flowers, most adult pollinators, butterflies and bees and moths are drinking nectar to sustain themselves, while bees are usually collecting pollen um, to feed their larvae as well. And then um, another aspect of forage and food are host plants for butterflies and moths. So we have um, Butterflies and moths laying their eggs on plants that are uh, host plants for their caterpillars to eat. So when we're thinking about providing forage as floral resources, these flowers that provide nectar and pollen, um, we need to think about how they're flowering across season. So most bees, butterflies, and moths have very short adult lifespans. And that adult life stage is when they are visiting flowers and pollinating plants. And these different insects have very specific emergent times and flight periods. So you'll only see a certain species usually um, at a certain time of year. But there are also things that are around all throughout the growing season. Social bees like bumblebees uh, will need a consistent source of food all throughout um, the growing season for um, their colony to grow. So if you have something blooming consistently across a growing season from like late winter all the way to late fall, you can support the most amount of uh, pollinators when you have the, this continuous blooming from different kinds of plants throughout the year. So just to, to show you a little example of this, um, you can see from this table of recommended pollinator plants that bloom times vary by species. So we have bloom season from spring through fall, and some things are very early in the year, some things are later, some things have very short bloom times, others have longer. So you wanna keep this in mind when you're looking for plants and knowing that you'll have um, different plants that are uh, blooming across all times of year. Um, and when we're looking at our different plants that we want to plant for pollinators, uh, we need, we really kind of recommend native plants for a few reasons. Uh, the first is that native pollinators co-evolved with our native plants. Um, many species are specialists and rely on a certain plant or even a certain pollinator to survive. And when a plant from a different part of the world is introduced, it's not hardwired into a pollinator's biology to use that plant species. So the native plants, they're um, much more you know, they're evolved to pollinate those plants. And another reason is that our native species are adapted specifically to our local conditions. Because they evolved in the region, that means they are perfectly adapted to survive the harsh climate of the Southwest, the harsh soils, 
and um, these native plants are more likely to not require a lot of care. And another reason is that they can usually have fewer pest problems because they evolved with the same pest species that are native here. They have developed evolved defenses to live alongside those pest species. So if you bring in, again, if you bring in something from a different part of the world, they may not be used to those kinds of pests that we have in the Southwest and they may not do so well. So I mentioned earlier that having plants with blooms th throughout the year is important and a variety of native plants can provide blooms at different times of year. And here's just an example suite of plants you could find in the Santa Fe area that bloom from late winter to late fall. And you can find these outside the Santa Fe area and bloom times may be a little different depending on region, but in most of the Southwest, you can see things like um, this white prairie clover and Rocky Mountain Pinstemon blooming earlier in the year and um, other asters and other things are blooming later in the year. So that, that's always a fun thing to do when you're out uh, walking for a hike is seeing the transition of different blooms throughout the year. And so if you don't have, let's say you have plenty of early springtime flowers, but you didn't um, plant many fall blooming species, um, earlier in the year, you'll probably not be able to support nearly as many bees that are emerging later in the year. So just keep in mind that's um, what we're aiming for when we're uh, trying to provide these blooms from late winter to late fall. Along with different bloom times, different shapes are also important. So Different pollinators have different abilities to collect pollen and access nectar. So there are different bees. We'll have, we have short tongued bees, we have long tongued bees, and really small bees, and then giant bumblebees. And those different sizes and shapes of bees um, will have a better ability to collect nectar and pollen from different plants. So, short-tongued and small bees are usually um, more efficient at collecting pollen and nectar from really small flowers that have like a landing pad like this carrot that has a, a beetle on it um, and then longer tongue bees can get into bigger flowers that have deeper um, nectar reservoirs and then also things um, like butterflies and moths have really long proboscis. So they have this really long straw that they drink nectar through. So this um, little Ipomopsis, uh, what is that called? The gilia, white flowered gilia. Uh, it um, needs a you know, long, long proboscis to reach that nectar reservoir. You can see how long and tubular uh, that flower is. So if you um, are lacking a certain size or shape of flower, you might not be able to support a specific kind of bee or butterfly that's um, made to pollinate that flower. Now, if you have a hard time finding na native plants of a certain shape or color or bloom time, or if they're already in your yard, it's totally fine to have some non-natives some introduced species, but you definitely want to keep a foundation of native plants um, in your pollinator garden. They're just able to support many more pollinator species and um, don't require as much uh, care because they're adapted to the region. Um, but you definitely, if you are looking at different introduced species, you might want to make sure they're not um, really weedy and might escape your yard and get into your neighbor's yard or go um, seed and go to seed and go into an open space and uh, take over and outcompete other native species. Um, so just an example from my yard in Santa Fe of some plants that are introduced but really popular with pollinators are these three. I've got a blue mist spirea that's covered in 
honeybees all the time, um, this red hot poker or torch lily um, was really popular with honeybees too. And then uh, this Rus Russian sage is also um, pretty popular. It's a, it's a little weedy, but um, it's, it's pretty popular with our pollinators. Now, plants don't just provide nectar and pollen. Their leaves and their stems are also very important for caterpillars, which are the larvae of butterflies and moths. And the plant that a butterfly or moth lays their eggs on for their larvae to eat are called host plants. And you're probably familiar with milkweeds being an important host plant for monarchs. So a female monarch butterfly will only lay her eggs on milkweed species as the eggs hatch and then they eat the milkweed. So um, I wanted to pull out milkweeds in particular because they're just such a superstar plant group for pollinator gardening and that they are host plants for monarch caterpillars and they are also really high quality nectar sources for other pollinators visiting the flowers to drink nectar. And they also are really great at supporting beneficial insects and that can help you prevent pesticide use, making your garden more po pollinator friendly. And yeah, so things like uh, spider milkweed and I believe um, showy milkweed, Miranda in the last webinar highlighted that those, they did a study that showed that those two species and a few others can really support beneficial insects that will eat pests in your garden. Now, to support more diversity of bees in your yard and to take care of some more interesting plants, there are a few specialist bees that you can keep in mind when selecting plants. So um, there's the didasia, the cactus and mallow bees. They're specialists on, I think that genus will specialize on a few other plants, but they're, um, it includes cactus bees that are really um, fond of native cactus in the region, also globe mallows. And then we also have um, a couple different genuses of squash bees that occur in the Southwest. And these um, come out really early in the morning and pollinate our different squash flowers. So one native that you could see a squash bee on early in the morning is coyote gourd. And they'll also be the ones pollinating your uh, garden food squashes, so pumpkins and um, cucumbers, all those different kinds of food plants. Another group of pollinators you can think about planting for are nocturnal and crepuscular pollinators. So nocturnal means they're most active at night. And crepuscular means they are most active um, in the evening, so like dawn and dusk. And many moths are great at pollinating flowers that are also pollinated during the day. So your garden is already likely supporting them. But um, there are some characteristics that are really appealing to our nighttime pollinators, which includes moths, some bees, some beetles, and bats in more southern New Mexico. But uh, things that are white or pale, so like this pale or evening primrose, um, they're more uh, easily seen in the dark um, since they stand out and can reflect moonlight. And then things that are more fragrant, so if you can smell something in the dark, you can probably find it better than if it didn't smell. So. I don't know if you've ever noticed like honeysuckle will get more fragrant in the evening and um, that's probably helps to attract uh, moth pollinators. And I just have this little example of a um, white-lined sphinx moth in my yard. It's, this is a group called hummingbird moths and they're just a really, really cool moth if you haven't seen them. Um, they'll be pollinating things that your butterflies pollinate as well. But they are, um, usually you can see them, they're more crepuscular, they come out in the uh, evening. 
So another plant we need to talk about, while they don't have really showy flowers, um, grasses are really important to pollinators as well. And they um, just make your yard a little more sustainable. They can provide structure to the soil and help water um, infiltrate the soil. They are an important host plant and shelter for butterflies. Um, I saw that blue or ground grass is the genus Budalua. Um, it can support um, the most number of uh, butterfly species as a host plant compared to other genuses of plants. Um, that was from a talk that the butterfly guy Steve Carey did for the Taos um, Native Plant Society. So that's a pretty cool talk if you want to learn more about butterflies and their host plants. Um, but grasses are also important overwintering sites for beneficial insects. And there are a few different options that are nice and ornamental and will make your yard quite pretty. Um, I've got a list here. And another nice thing about grasses is, you know, while they don't have those showy flowers, they do like add this nice texture to your yard. And in the wind, they include some movement. So aesthetically, they're great. Ecologically, they're great. So consider plant or consider grasses. <laughs> Um, one thing to mention is uh, cultivars and cultivar plant varieties. Um, it's best to avoid double flowered hybrids and other ornate modern varieties or cultivars, which often produce little or no pollen or nectar. So these garden varieties are often bred for characteristics that are more desirable to humans and not bees, and you don't want to garden variety yard. And uh, not all plants are equal, and just because it blooms doesn't mean it gives pollen and nectar, and that doesn't mean that bees uh, like it either. So um, try and avoid these really showy double uh, petaled cultivars. Um, but there are some other, there are some cultivars and uh, ornamental plants that um, do look really nice and provide lots of nectar and pollen. And um, things like lots of herbs are really great for pollinators like dill and lavender and mint. Those are um, really popular with pollinators. And another thing you can do um, when you're looking for things that attract pollinators is just watch your yard, watch your neighbor's yard and in your neighborhood and see, just observe what is visiting and what is there. And um, if one of those plants is really great at attracting pollinators, you can consider that as an option. Now, one really important thing to mention with um, selecting plants for your pollinator garden is uh, hidden pesticides. So just because a pollinator or a plant label says pollinator friendly, that does not mean it is free of pesticides. That might mean it's attractive to pollinators, but that label does, is not regulated and um, pesticides could be used on something that is labeled that. Um, the best thing you can do when searching for pesticide free plants is to talk to the nursery owner and make sure you're buying certified organic plants. Um, there's no guarantee you'll be getting entirely pesticide-free plants. Um, a lot of times seeds are treated uh, with systemic pesticides, so that will um, follow them for quite a while. And then um, nurseries source plants from other places, so it's really hard to track that pesticide use. So, um, yeah, reaching out to local nurseries is really the best way to um, talk to them about potentially carrying plant, stop carrying plants that aren't treated with pesticides and ask them to carry maybe more native and locally adapted plants. 
And um, if, it, if a nursery is willing to work with you to increase um, more pesticide-free native plants, let others know that's a good place where you can get um, good pollinator-friendly plants. <laughs> um, so pressure from consumers has um, done some good things. It's um, made some big nurseries stop uh, carrying plants that have pesticides like neonicotinoids and big box stores like Lowe's and Home Depot are slowly phasing out plants um, treated with neonicotinoids, but other pesticides are being used as well. So just, it's just something to keep in mind. Um, one thing you can do uh, to make sure you're getting seeds that aren't treated is saving seeds from the own flowers in your yard um, and making sure that they weren't sprayed at any certain time. Um, so saving your own seeds. Uh, there's a few different programs like the Santa Fe Seed Library that you can get um, seeds from that aren't treated. So uh, just something to keep in mind is um, finding plants that don't have pesticides. Um, one thing to mention about garden design is um, to plant in clumps. So bees like to visit flowers they're familiar with, and they only visit a few flowers on a single trip from when they're collecting pollen to take back to their nest. So planting flowers in clumps allows them to collect pollen from the same species in a single trip, and that helps make their trips more efficient and uh, Looks nice too, I think. <laughs> and another thing you consider for your, you can consider for your garden is some kind of signage. Uh, you can let your neighbors know by including signage. Uh, that's a great way to educate and engage others about urban pollinator habitat. Maybe you're concerned about your yard looking a little messy, and you don't want people to judge, or you just want to spread the good news of pollinator habitat, a sign is a really good way to uh, do that. And these signs are available, um, these specific pollinator signs are available through the Xerce Society, if you're interested in one of those. Um, another thing to consider about garden design is to think about the different sites in your yard and how um, you know, your south facing side of your house is much more different than the north facing side. And you can identify different microclimates or areas that are especially hot and dry or cool and wet and um, consider what plants you want to use there. Figure out what will thrive in this more moist area versus this hotter, drier area, what can thrive in the shade. And also think about um, water use and how um, runoff from your roof or maybe collecting water can help you um, plan your garden a little better. So, oops. Okay. And the next thing you can do is um, consider climate resilient options. So we're facing climate change in the southwest. It's, we're probably going to have more severe droughts and selecting hardy native species that are already able to withstand severe droughts um, will ensure that you have a um, resilient pollinator garden. And if you want to find things with um, drought tolerance and temperature tolerance, a lot of native plants already have that, have those traits built in. Um, you can, obviously you don't wanna pick a bunch of plants from a really higher elevation from where you're at, but um, yeah, make sure you're selecting species appropriate to your exact location and site conditions. Um, I also wanted to point out some work that the Nature Conservancy is doing in Albuquerque. Um, they have a really great uh, plant ready tree list with, or a climate, <laughs> climate ready tree list. And it um, gives examples of different trees that do really well in um, different areas and what is likely to survive increasing temperatures in the Southwest. So look into uh, 
the Nature Conservancy and then also the water, Albuquerque Water Authority, um, they have rebates for buying trees and yeah, lots of really great um, help there for Albuquerque residents. Um, another thing you can do um, for your garden design is just provide a source of water. We are in a very water limited area and um, honeybees need water to keep their colonies cool. And um, another thing to consider about water is to do really deep irrigation um, that will allow a lot of your, a lot of your plants to um, produce more nectar and um, provide a source of moisture for uh, like migrating butterflies will um, sip from water that on the ground or plant do. Um, another thing is windbreaks and these can provide shelter and um, allow for more easy access and pollinating for flowers in a really windy area. So um, just a few examples of um, wind protection trees, there's New Mexico privet, junipers, um, four leaf sagebrush. Uh, these are good um, plants to consider for wind breaks. Now, the next thing we need to consider is shelter. And we'll discuss how um, the shelter is used for nesting and overwintering sites, how you can identify um, where those places are in your yard. So things like stems and leaf litter, uh, brush piles, rock piles, snags and stumps. Those are all good places that provide shelter for egg laying and overwintering. And the most important thing for shelter is to protect um, areas that you already have instead of trying to make new es nesting areas. Um, so less is more for shelter management. And while there may not be clear signs of pollinators nesting in your yard, they probably are utilizing it and may just can't be seen. So one thing you can do to um, improve shelter is just saying no to lawns and rocks. Um, lawns really provide very little in the way of habitat and they use a lot of water. Um, they don't really provide much shelter or nesting habitat. And the same with rocks. I mean, they obviously don't use a lot of water, but um, they don't provide um, much shelter or floral, obviously no floral resources for pollinators. And if you can't say no to your lawn, um, just consider maybe allowing some weeds to um, take over it. I mean, not take over, but <laughs> like let clover uh, bloom in your lawn or try and uh, mow in uh, longer intervals, like let some things go to um, flower if you can. Now, we uh, talked about this in the very first um, webinar with Olivia, but there are a few different kinds of bees. You can um, group them by how they nest and our ground nesting bees are ones that will need some bare ground to nest in. There are tunnel nesting or cavity nesting bees. And there are also the bumblebees, which um, are also cavity nesters and require a little bit bigger uh, shelter for nesting. So how do you recognize a bee ground nest? So they're usually just tiny little holes in the ground. And one approach is to search several times during the season as different species become active at different times through the season. And their nests are more likely to occur in semi-bare patches of soil in a well-drained area, so typically on slopes. And 
to find ground nesting bees, pay attention to bees flying low over the ground where bees usually aren't pleasant, so like not a lot of um, flowers or something. So um, if you have these spaces in your yard, then you probably have a good uh, nesting area for bees. And one thing you can do to help promote that ground nesting is by leaving areas of undisturbed patches of bare soil. And um, relatively undisturbed conditions will allow bee nests to become well established and um, just avoid any use of landscape fabric or mulching over your entire yard. You want to make sure that they can access the ground and try not to cover it back up so when they do need to emerge in spring they can they can get out. Um, in general it's important that ground nest sites receive direct sunlight and that bare soil even in small patches is accessible among the different plants in your yard and that might mean trimming back some bushes or trees occasionally and keeping weeds or grass from becoming too dense. Um, and then clippings or dead plant material should be mostly removed from some areas of a site um, just so uh, those bare ground um, patches can be accessible. And then a few rocks can help encourage um, nesting of some bee species, but not, not a lot. You don't want complete heavy rock mulch coverage, um, but a few rocks um, are a, help the bee narrow down on where they want to nest. Now the other group of nesting type of bees are tunnel nesters, and that includes leaf cutter and mason bees, and they'll nest in things like hollow or pithy plant stems, so pithy means like not entirely hollow, but kind of spongy in the middle. Um, and they can also use things that are brush piles and um, just cavities and all different kinds of things um, to nest in. So one thing you can do is just leave some stalks intact over the winter. Um, prune in early spring to help create those nest sites so that those stems are exposed. And um, one thing to mention is that uh, Olivia Carroll, the our bee expert in our very first webinar of this series, um, said that there aren't a lot of um, cavity nesting bees in the southwest. It's mostly ground nesting. But if you're in a wetter area, if you're lucky enough to be like in the Bosque or in a riparian area, you'll probably have a few more cavity nesting bee species. And you can um, put up these artificial tunnel nests, um, but you may, you just, just so you know, you may not have great luck um, because most of our bees are ground nesters. Um, but the one thing to keep in mind about these is that they can be susceptible to parasites and fungi and they need to be cleaned out or replaced and don't cluster a bunch of them um, in one area that will help spread disease. But you can wash these with mild bleach and re-drill holes if you want to give these a try. So for butterflies and moths, um, they need undisturbed patches of habitat for uh, overwintering. Um, a lot of uh, butterflies and moths um, overwinter in their pupa stage, but others also overwinter in their adult stage too. But this just means that they need um, some area of your yard that's not going to be disturbed. and. Um, Let's see. Oh, I was going to mention morning cloaks are a butterfly that overwinter as adults, and but a lot of um, butterflies and moths winter as this pupa stage or chrysalis 
or, um, and they need those unmanicured locations to provide nooks and crannies that uh, they can hide in for the winter. So, and finally, our last three elements of pollinator habitat, and that is protection from pesticides. So if you have an area free of pesticides, you're definitely more likely to support more pollinators. And the reason we use pesticides is to manage disease and other pests. And uh, we'll go into this in other um, webinars in this series, more about beneficial insects and um, integrative pest management. But uh, just to touch on it really quickly, um, the best thing you can think of doing is uh, trying to prevent these problems from happening. So responding to an underlying issue. So if you notice something is disease, cut it out and dispose of it so that it doesn't um, come back in your garden. Um, for example, powdery mildew, I have it on my roses. <laughs> um, it affects many garden plants, such as squash and grapes, and it's likely to come back if you treat it with a pesticide. So one thing you can do instead is to remove the conditions that allow that powdery mildew to survive. And some of those causes might be overwatering or insufficient airflow or over fertilization. So knowing how to prevent these pests is um, really the best way to address them. And when we're thinking about um, other pests in your garden, one thing I really wanted to point out is that um, most insects are beneficial. You have insects that are eating your pest and also just consider uh, tolerating some plant damage. So your pollinator garden that you've made to uh, support pollinators, some of those pollinators do some plant damage. So th this top picture here is um, an example of a leaf cutter bee um, trimming out some parts of leaves on a rose bush. Uh, they use these to build their nest. So if you're trying to support bees, they might be uh, cutting some holes in some leaves and uh, that's, that's tolerable. And then, oops, um, another example here, this is a little uh, cabbage white butterfly caterpillar. Um, they're uh, tiny little caterpillars and they'll do some damage to leaves, but uh, their adult form is a nice um, pollinating butterfly that you probably want in your garden. And then um, another thing is to consider supporting beneficial insects and allowing um, those insects to do your pest control for you. Um, and this is called conservation biological control, which just means you're attracting species that prey on the pest in your habitat. Um, so if you watch the webinar before this one, you learned all about assassin bugs and minute pirate bugs and lace wings, but um, there's lots of different insects you can find in your garden that um, will do your pest management for you. And watch our other webinars to learn how to create habitat for them. Now, with weeds, instead of spraying herbicides, you can maybe learn to tolerate some weedy species. Um, you'll definitely want to take control of any things that are like really invasive and might take over your native plants or your other pollinator habitat. And if you do need to get rid of things, try to do it by hand. And um, if you do use um, any herbicides, be very, very targeted about it. Don't broadcast spray and don't try to try to avoid using it when um, blooms are out. So, um, and we'll talk more about that in our other uh, webinars as well. So this um, principles of 
IPM, which is Integrative Pest Management. Um, just go through these different steps um, before you consider using pesticides. Make sure um, you're trying to figure out why pester in your garden, how you can um, prevent that from occurring, and um, make sure you're, you know what you're spraying for. All right, so those are the three main principles of food, shelter, and protection from pesticides. And what are opportunities we can find for creating that habitat in urban landscapes? The opportunities um, are large and small, and no matter what scale you're working at, the principles are the same. So we can think of about habitat at a few different scales. Um, the scale I'm working at in this webinar is really the neighborhood scale. So just making sure you provide those really basic needs of uh, food, shelter, and safety in your small um, area you're working with. So where can you create habitat? The answer is everywhere. Um, but if you're working at a bigger scale, like if you're doing um, uh, citywide um, habitat management, you want to think about things like how far can a bee fly and where can we put pollinator cor or habitat cor corridors that um, can really benefit and connect existing habitat on the landscape. But for our purposes, we're talking really at finer scales, so where can we provide just those basic elements of a pollinator habitat? And that includes all kinds of things like backyards, urban farms, community gardens, roadsides, golf courses, um, commercial property landscaping, parks are a great place, schools, that's an educational opportunity. And then even just little planters on your porch, they can provide um, flower, pollen, nectar resources for different pollinators. And when we support pollinators, um, that helps many other non-pollinator species by providing a safe place to live. And native habitat in urban settings provides really welcome areas for a wide range of local species. In particular, birds like to forage on seeds of native plants and they'll be eating your caterpillar um, of your butterflies and such. And shrub and tree plantings also provide areas for them to perch and nest. So, um, Supporting these different ecosystems, if you're supporting your pollinators, you're also supporting um, the base of the food chain for many, many more species. For example, a uh, Carolina chickadee here must gather 10,000 caterpillars in a period of about three weeks to successfully raise their chicks. So our uh, pollinator gardens giving um, a place to live for caterpillars Feeding, feeding everyone else too. And installing pollinator habitat and landscaping with native plants also benefits our water quality. So often native plants really don't even need watering after they become established because they are adapted to our climate and landscape and they're more resistant to pest pressures. So growing pollinator habitat without pesticides also reduces the runoff of pesticides into our stormwater systems and ultimately into our rivers and streams. So uh, lots of ripple effects for just creating some pollinator habitat in your yard. Now, lots and lots of information from many different people doing really great things um, to help us with gardening and native plants. We have um, New Mexico State University Extension. You can call their offices. They have county agents, lots of resources online. They um, implement the Master Gardener programs. The Master Gardeners in Santa Fe and Albuquerque and probably other places um, have really great websites and then lots of information on gardening in New Mexico. 
Um, there's this one specific uh, document I wanted to point out. It's um, by the NRCS Plant Materials Program, and it's a pollinator plant recommendation list for New Mexico that has a lot of really great pollinator plants to look at. You Google that. Um, and then there's the Albuquerque Backyard Refuge Program. I mentioned them earlier. They're helping build um, pollinator habitat in Albuquerque, but um, also any backyard wildlife habitat, really. And we have the New Mexico Native Plant Society. They have really great publications and recordings on YouTube you can watch. Those are really nice to watch. Um, and then the Ber Albuquerque Bernalillo County Water Utility Authority have um, some resources on xeriscaping and they have these great rebate programs for helping you afford trees um, to place in your gardens and yards. And also if you want to remove lawns, they do a rebate program to help you um, turn your lawn into a more xeriscaped uh, plant family or plant uh, region. And there are many others, I'm probably forgetting some, but um, you can find a lot of them if you follow links in these different websites. Um, and to uh, highlight some Xerces information, we have um, a few different programs and information online about pesticides and how to support pollinators in your yards. We have several books that are really helpful um, for learning uh, how to feed bees, how to, what uh, pollinators are and where they come from, how you can support them and lots of different brochures and reports. It's just, it's a lot. Um, so uh, one thing I wanted to point out is that we do have one document specific to the Southwest, and that is a monarch nectar plant list. So if you're wanting to provide nectar plants for monarchs, this has everything in it, and be on the lookout for new documents specific to the Southwest. Um, we have plant list in the works, and well, since, since I'm here now, we now have presence in New Mexico. We'll be working on Southwest uh, specific uh, documents and publications. So finally, I wanted to quickly thank New Mexico State University for um, the grant they're using to support this webinar series. The Carol Pet Petrie Foundation is helping fund the work that Xerces Society does in the Southwest. And then finally, um, the Xerces Society um, members that really help make artwork possible. Now, questions. <laughs> Thanks so much, Caitlin. And I know we only have probably a few minutes here for questions. Um, I just wanted to summarize some of the things that I saw quite a few questions about. Um, a lot of you asked where you could get a copy of the list of pollinator plants with the phenology that um, you posted in your slides. Um, that is a USDA NRCS guide. That's the pollinator plants of New Mexico. So it is posted in the Q&A under um, quite a few people's questions if you look for the link down there. Um, we also got quite a few questions about how to access the earlier webinars in the series. Those we are working to get up on YouTube as soon as possible after we correct the captions. And we'll email those links out to everyone who's participated in the series once those are available. Um, so stay tuned for that. But now for Caitlin, we have a question that's come in from Las Cruces where um, she says, I am hoping to beautify a weedy strip near my yard. I bought Southwest seed pack, including poppies, and I'm wondering when and how to plant them. It's very hot and dry here. Um, and water them would rather have drought tolerant species. So do you know about when to when to plant down there? Um, yeah, since I'm up here, most of my research, since I'm up in Santa Fe, most of my research on when to plant has been for these higher uh, altitudes. And, um, but my understanding is most of those um, more native seed mixes you can sow like late in the fall and then they'll go through their stratification and um, everything necessary to make them um, germinate in the spring. So I would probably look in, at late fall, but you can also contact your um, local extension agent to 
potentially get a better um, exact answer on that. Right, and germination is going to vary from year to year depending on how much precipitation you get. Sometimes some of our plants in the southwest take a very long time to germinate depending on how much rain they've received. Um, I'm seeing a question about would red hot poker dried stems trimmed in the spring provide tunnel nesting locations? I'm not familiar with that plant. So that was the um, the lily tort or torch lily. Um, it's okay. a yeah yeah it's um I can I would imagine so. Um, I I have never actually looked like inside the stem of one of those, but I assume since it's um, not extremely woody that it would um, provide a good nice hollow place for uh, a cavity nester. Great. Um, I just learned today that Monarda fistulosa, which is the species name for bee balm, is named fistulosa because it's full of holes. And it, if you've ever trimmed down a bee balm stem, it has, a, it has the pithy stem that bees will burrow their way into. So I just learned that that's what the species name meant. Oh, that's cool. Yeah, so you're getting a lot of thank yous and I, I'll echo oh, them. Thank, thank, you, thank you so much for covering all that info in that short amount of time. So yes. next week we're going to talk about crop pollinators and pollination um, and how to integrate habitat on farms and ranches. So if you're interested in that, please tune in and check out what's available for the rest of the series. I also wanted to mention in two weeks time, we're gonna cover integrated pest and pollinator management, which is gonna go into a lot more detail on pesticide impacts on pollinators, um, including organic pesticides. So if you're curious about that, register for that webinar. So thanks a lot. We'll see yeah. you next time. Thank you.